Hey guys, so sorry if this is not the most exciting video you've ever seen in your life as far as editing. This is actually just going to be me reading you this book. Um, but I came across something in here that I just had to share with you all because I really want your opinion on it. This book is not actually about the more out there theories of what happened in Area 51. It's about the things that have happened on record out there. The real story... It's reportedly the real story of some of the things that have gone on. I mean, there's obviously a lot we really don't know at all. And it's written by this woman, Annie Jacobson, who, I mean, she's a contributing editor for the Los Angeles Times, and she gets very apologist at times for the national security state and the things that have been done off the record and have never been declassified that really the public should have a right to know, but, you know, they're trying to protect us. And she actually separates herself a lot from conspiracy theorists in here, even though a lot of the information she provides in here about things the CIA does. And she even mentions the New World Order. She kind of proves the point, but still keeps herself separate, I think, is a defense mechanism to give herself more credibility, because we all know what happens when you get called a conspiracy theorist. But anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole point of this that I wanted to read you is actually this revelation section I got to at the end that kind of blew my mind because I've never heard this before as a theory of what actually happened at the Roswell crash site. And we know there was something that happened or at least there was something that was reported because they put out news stories right after that official military news story saying there was a crash, that there was a disc, and then they changed it to a weather balloon and now they say there was no crash. and So something obviously went down. But was it little green men? If you go to Roswell, that's what they try to tell you. I mean, they paint those, paint those things on everything. Even the Walmart Supercenter in Roswell is covered in aliens. But here, this this thing kind of, I don't know. What do you guys think about this? Because I had never heard this before. So she starts off by talking about Operation Paperclip and how after World War II, we brought over all these Nazis and that even today, there are 600 million pages of information about this that remains classified as of 2011, and that there are many documents about Area 51 in that pile. So that makes me feel really good. I have another book over there on the floor that discusses how there are at least, at least 10,000 Nazis on record tied to that program. 10,000 people that were tied to the government allowing them to come over here and have safe haven. And it just kind of, it's insane that there are still 600 million pages of stuff. We do not know what actually happened there. And it's tied to Area 51 in some ways. And she says here that the reason why the federal government will not officially admit that Area 51 exists, because it's right there on the surface and everyone knows it's there. You can go to Google Earth and see it. But they still won't admit it's, it's real. She says it's not because of secret spy planes or stealth bombers or the drones that were and still are flight tested there. The reason is actually something completely different. It has to do with a program undertaken by five EG&G engineers at Area 51. And she mentions EG&G earlier in the book as being one of the defense contractors that hardly anyone even knows existed. She says this program involved the Roswell crash remains and predated the development of the original CIA facility currently called Area 51, which was built by Richard Bissell beginning in 1955. Area 51 is named such not because it was a randomly chosen quadrant, as has often been presumed, but because the 1947 crash remains from Roswell, New Mexico, were sent from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base out to a secret spot in the Nevada desert in 1951. And then she goes on to say... The flying craft that crashed in New Mexico, the myth of which has come to be known as the Roswell Incident, happened on, in 1947, 64 years before the publication of this book. Everyone directly involved in the incident who acted on behalf of the government is apparently dead. Like it does about Area 51, the U.S. government refuses to admit the Roswell crash ever actually happened. But it did, according to the seminal testimony of one man she interviewed for 18 months for this book. He participated in the engineering project that came out as a result of the Roswell incident and was one of the elite engineers from EG&G who was tasked with the original Area 51 wicked engineering problem. In July of 1947, Army intelligence spearheaded the efforts to retrieve the remains of the flying disc that crashed at Roswell, and as with other stories that have become the legends of Area 51, part of the conspiracy theory about Roswell has its origins in truth. The crash did reveal a disc, not a weather balloon, as has subsequently been alleged by the Air Force. 
And responders from the Roswell Army Airfield found not only a crash craft, but two crash sites, and they found bodies alongside the craft. These were not aliens, nor were they consenting airmen. They were human guinea pigs. Here's where it gets really horrible, you guys. Unusually petite for pilots, they appeared to be children. Each was under five feet tall. Physically, the bodies of the aviators revealed anatomical conundrums. They were grotesquely deformed, but each in the same manner as the others. They had unusually large heads and abnormally shaped, oversized eyes. One fact was clear. These children, if that's what they were, were not healthy humans. A second fact was shocking. Two of the child-sized aviators were comatose but still alive. So... Not aliens, but grossly deformed children. Everything related to the crash site was sent to the Wright Field, later called Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, where it remained until 1951. That's when the evidence was packed up and transported to the Nevada test site. It was received physically by the elite group of EG&G engineers. The Atomic Energy Commission, which, by the way, is was merged and is now the Department of Energy, so... <laughs> They, you know, they do the Human Genome Project today. Just think about that, okay? Not the Air Force and not the CIA was put in charge of the Roswell crash remains. According to the unusual character, the Atomic Energy Commission was the organization best equipped to handle a secret that could never be declassified. The AEC needed engineers they could trust to handle the work that was about to begin. For this, they looked for the most powerful defense contractor in the nation that no one had ever heard of, EG&G. Engineers of the EG&G were chosen to receive the crash remains and to set up a secret facility just outside the boundary of the Nevada test site, 16 miles to the northwest of Groom Lake, approximately five and a half miles north of the northernmost point of Areas 12 and Area 15, where they meet. A facility this remote would never be visited by anyone outside a small group with a strict need to know and would never have to be accounted for or appear on any official Nevada test maps. These five men were told they were there was more engineering work to be done and that they would be the only five individuals of the set of keys to the facility. The project, the men were told, was the most clandestine, important engineering program since the Manhattan Project, which is why the man who'd been in charge of that one would function as a director of this as well. So then she goes on to say that Vinever Bush was their direct boss on this and that these men were told they were about to work on, what, what they were about to work on was so important it would remain black forever. So it would never see the light of day. It would never be declassified. The men knew that a secrecy classification inside the AEC charter made this possible because they all worked on classified engineering projects that were hidden from the rest of the world. They understood that born classified meant that no one would ever have a need to know what Vinever Bush was going to ask them to do. The operation would have no name, only a letter number designation, S4 or Sigma 4. The problem that the EG&G engineers would face would be highly complex, wide-ranging, and without a defi definite formulation with no set solution. This wicked problem was wholly without precedent. Solving it was undoubtedly have in unintended consequences because playing the engineering game would change the game. But there were two puzzles to solve, not just one. <laughs> this gets really screwed up. So the claim here now is that this crashed craft had been sent by Stalin... And there was Russian writing stamp in, or embossed on the inside of the craft to let them know that. And the EG&G EG engineers were told that no one working on the project when it had been headquartered at Wright-Patterson had been able to discern what made his craft hover and fly. Not even the German paperclip scientists who'd been assigned to assist. So that's lovely. So a, cra a, a craft had been sent over. It was a flying disc. And it could hover and fly in ways that supposedly our government did not know or understand at that time how they made this work. So the crash craft was job number one, reverse engineer it, Vinnerer Bush said, take it apart, put it back together, figure out what makes it fly. Here's where it gets horrible. But there was a second engineering problem to solve, the one that involved the child-sized aviators. To understand this, the men were briefed on what it was they were dealing with. They had to be, they were told that they and they alone had a need to know about what happened to these little humans. Because two of the aviators were comatose, the men would have to transfer them into a jello-like substance and stand them upright in two tubular tanks attached to a life support system. Sometimes their mouths opened and this gave the appearance of them trying to speak. Remember, the engineers were told these humans are in a comatose state, they're unconscious, their bodies would never spark back to life. Which is exactly like an Outer Limits episode that came out in the 90s and a lot of the episodes of X-Files. I mean, think about that. This is very close to that. Once the children had been healthy humans, they were considered to be 13 years old. 
Uh, why were their heads so big? Why had their bodies been surgically manipulated to appear inhuman? Why did they have oversized eyes? And then this book goes on to say that according to this EG and G engineer, these children were victims of Joseph Mengele, who was the madman at Auschwitz who performed unspeakable experimental procedures on children, dwarfs, and twins. And that before the war ended, Mengele had made a deal with Stalin that he could continue his eugenics work in secret over in the Soviet Union and have safe passage, kind of like their own Operation Paperclip. And they were told this deal likely occurred just before the end of the war, uh, when all these people were fleeing Nazi war crimes, etc. In Mengele's efforts to create a pure Aryan race for Hitler at Auschwitz and elsewhere, he conducted experiments on people he considered subhuman so as to breed certain features out. His victims included Jewish children, gypsy children, people with severe physical disform deformities. He removed parts of children's craniums and replaced them with the bones from larger adult skulls. He removed and transplanted eyeballs and injected people with chemicals that caused them to lose their hair. And it goes on to talk about how there were people who were forced to assist him in Auschwitz and draw pictures of these children. He had all these drawings. When Mengele left Auschwitz, he took all this documentation of his medical experiments with him, and his only son, Rolf, said he was still in possession of all of that stuff after the war. The EG and G engineers were told that part of Stalin's offer to Mengele stated that if he could create a crew of grotesque, child-sized aviators for Stalin, he'd be given a lab with which to continue his work. According to what the engineers were told, Mengele held up his side of the Faustian bargain, provided Stalin with the child-sized crew, but Stalin did not and Mengele never took up residence in the Soviet Union. Instead, he escaped to South America, which we know, thanks to the guy that started the Bilderberg Group, there were a lot of people that did that. And he was able to live out his life in Argentina and Paraguay until his death in 1979. What a piece of crap that guy was. Anyways, so Stalin sent these biologically and surgically re-engineered children who had their hair falling out, their eyes were replaced with larger eyes, they had their skulls replaced with pieces of adult skull to make their heads look bulbous and gigantic. So you're talking about what would look like an alien. I'm sure if a chemical, some kind of radiation makes your hair fall, it would probably gray your skin as well. And put them in this craft that he had built and sent it over to New Mexico. It says, hoping that it would land there, the engineers were told, and Stalin's plan was for these children to climb out and be mistaken for visitors from Mars. Panic would ensue, just as it did after the radio broadcast of War of the Worlds. America's early warning radar system would be overwhelmed with sightings of UFOs. Truman would see how easily a totalitarian dictator could control the masses using black propaganda. Stalin may have been behind the United States' atomic bomb technology, but when it came to manipulating people's perceptions, he was a leader with the upper hand. And this is what the engineers were told happen now that doesn't mean that is what happened but that's a pretty horrifying and yet somehow kind of believable thesis about what happened but that's not even where the worst of it is the worst of it comes in this last part where she tries to get the full story from this guy he won't tell her for months i asked the engineer why president truman didn't use the remains from roswell to show the world what an evil abhorrent man stalin was i guess that maybe truman didn't want to admit the breach of u.s borders for a long time i never got an answer just a shaking of the head here was the engineer who had the answer to the riddle inside the riddle that is area 51 but he's unwilling to say more he was the only one of the original elite group of eg and g engineers who was still alive he wouldn't tell me more no matter how many times i asked one day i asked again why didn't president truman reveal the truth in 1947 this time he answered because we were doing the same thing, he said. They wanted to push science. They wanted to see how far they could go. Then he said, we did things I wished I had not done. Then we performed medical experiments on handicapped children and prisoners. But you are not a doctor, I said. They wanted engineers. On whose authority did you act? The Atomic Energy Commission was in charge and Vannevar Bush, he said. People were killed in this great United States. Why did we do that? You do what you do because you love your country, and you're told what you're doing is for the good of the country, the engineer said, meaning out at the original Area 51 starting in 1951, EG&G engineers worked in secret on a nefarious Nazi-inspired black project that would m remain entirely hidden from the public because Vannevar Bush told them that was the correct thing to do. It was a long, long time ago, the engineer said. I've tried to forget. When did it end, I asked. No answer. In 1952, I asked. Still no answer. In 53, 
54. At least through the 1980s, it was still going on, he said. Think about that. And we know the Department of Energy and the Atomic Energy Commission that predated it, became it. We know they were working on experiments against unwitting people using chemical and biological agents, radiation, all kinds of stuff. I mean, some of that stuff has come out. Some of it came out because remember Bush apolo- or I'm sorry, Clinton apologized for it back in what, 95, I think? Thousands of government-sponsored experiments did take place at hospitals, universities, and military bases around our nation. The goal was to understand the effects of radiation exposure on the human body. While most of the tests were ethical by any standards, some were unethical, not only by today's standards, but by the standards of the time in which they were conducted. So we know that that actually happened. Some of it did. But there's no way we know the whole story, not even close. And actually, she goes on to say that he should tell her the whole story. He says, you don't have a need to know. For many months, she tried to learn. One day I asked him how much of the story I knew. You don't know the half of it, he said sadly. I took a crouton left over from my lunch and set it down in the middle of a restaurant white china plate. If what I know equals this crouton, I said pointing at the little brown piece of bread, then what is then is what I don't know as big as this plate. Oh my dear, he said shaking his head, the whole truth is bigger than this table we are eating on, including the chairs. So he wouldn't say anything else. That is the most... That is all he would tell her. I mean, she asked if Clinton got close, if he ever figured it out. She goes on to say, According to my source, the Atomic Energy Commission conducted experiments on humans in a classified government facility in the Nevada desert beginning in 1951. Although this was done in direct violation of Nuremberg Code of 1947, it's far from the first time the commission had acted in violation of the most basic moral principle involving voluntary human consent. In 1993, reporter Eileen Wilson wrote a newspaper story stating the AEC had conducted plutonium experiments on human beings, most notably retarded children and orphan boys from the Fernald State School outside Boston without the children's or guardian's knowledge or consent. After this horrible revelation came to light, President Clinton opened an investigation to look into what the AEC had done and the secrets it had been able to safeguard inside. It's terrifying and unprecedented system of secret keeping. I asked the engineer why President Clinton hadn't learned of the S-4 facility at Area 51, or had he? I think he might have come very close, the engineer said, but they kept it from him. Who were they? Who inherited those keys from you five engineers, I wanted to know. You don't have a need to know, is all that he would say. And she goes on to say that fighting totalitarianism was America's rationale for building 70,000 nuclear weapons in 65 styles in a free and open democratic society conducting projects in the same in the name of science is one thing, but keeping 40-year-old secrets from a president, even after he tries to find them out, is an entirely different problem for a democratic nation. It sets a precedent. It makes it easier for a group of powerful men to set up a program that defies the Constitution and defiles morality in the name of science and national security, all under the deceptive cover that no one has a need to know. I believe that even though the engineer didn't tell me everything, this is why he told me what he did. And, I mean, she hits the nail on the head there, but doesn't admit it. I mean, we are a totalitarian, scientific dictatorship. It's the cryptocracy. That's what's going on here. And these are the things that they were doing back then. I mean, were there children in this crashed craft out at Roswell that ended up being experimented on by the AEC? I don't know that, but it's, it's one of the more strangely plausible stories that I've ever been told and at least that is what these engineers claim they were told when they were working out there on this project I mean this guy was basically doing a deathbed confession he was very old he was going to die so he decided to tell at least a little bit of what happened to try and alleviate his conscience not only does that set a horribly terrifying precedent as just as she said but if that's what they were doing then can you imagine what they're doing today